Okay. Friends, thank you very much for joining us. In case you don't know, my name is Ian Paul. I'm a um, minister in the Church of England and involved in things like General Synod and the Archbishop's Council. Uh, but today I'm being joined by Rhiannon McAleer. Rhiannon, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, yeah, you have. Yeah. Thank you. Now, you, that's interesting because your names are a combination of Welsh and Irish, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So uh, my family hail from Wales, my, my mother's side, um, and my husband's family are Irish by heritage. That's very good, because I'm half Irish, so I'm very impressed with oh, that. So, great. <laughs> now, Rhiannon, um, you're working at Bible Society. Tell us what your role is there. Yeah, I'm head of research and impact. So my role is broadly to support Bible Society with... Um, insights into big social trends that could affect our ability to do our mission as well as audience groups so a, a huge part of what we do is understanding different groups within the population within England and Wales and understanding attitudes to both Christianity and the Bible trying to look for barriers and, and opportunities uh, we also take apart big data sets like the, the census and the British Social Attitudes Survey mm. to, to really understand whether the currents that shape those attitudes um, and ultimately will, will shape our ability to do our work as well. Well, that sounds really fascinating. How did you get into this? Are you, is your background sort of mathematics and statistics and that sort of thing? Uh, no, I'm qualitative, qualitative trained, uh, oh, right, okay. but I have developed a real love for statistics. It's Ooh. an ongoing, <laughs> ongoing passion of mine, very much a wannabe statistician, uh, hoping to do data science one day, maybe. Yeah. Um, my training Training is in uh, religious studies. Um, right. I did my undergrad work at Lancaster, so I've got um, a good sort of understanding of contemporary religion rather than theology. That, that's where I'm coming from. And then my postgrad work was in comparative religion, particularly around uh, Islam. Um, and I got really good kind of grounding in methodology um, through that work. And once I left academia, uh, the work at Bible Society opened up and I managed to talk my way into the job and I've been here seven years um, and it, it's been a, a really wonderful experience. It's a really fantastic organisation that's trying to do some brave and bold uh, things and very pro-research, which is fantastic and, and rigorous research. Um, our chief executive, Paul Williams, is, is a researcher by training, so we don't get away with any sloppy thinking. It's okay. um, yeah, for, uh, robust is what we aim for. Now, really, I'm really fascinated to hear about how you articulated the, the vision for what you're doing in terms of research. That does sound to me as though it's potentially extremely useful information for churches. Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and I wasn't aware of that. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm surprised myself. I wasn't aware of that you were doing that stuff, which has has such a, a pertinent irrelevance for churches thinking about mission evangelism and growth and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. We undertook a massive piece of research um, in uh, 2018. We surveyed 19,000 adults in England and Wales. For anyone who's not a statistician, that is massive, okay? Yeah. It, a, a poll can be between 1,000 and 2,000 people and be useful and be representative. So to go to 19,000 is kind of crazy big. It gives us a very high confidence in what the data is showing us, providing you, you trust the sample, which we partnered with YouGov, very good um, kind of research agency and, and we do trust the sample. And that piece of work, um, we did a lot of statistical work with it and we undertook something called um, cluster analysis, in particular for your statisticians, uh, latent class analysis. And we identified eight segments in the population um, kind of brought together by their attitudes towards the Bible, their openness towards the Bible, their church going behaviors and their Bible reading behaviors. And that was really fascinating because it kind of demonstrated that while we might hear of a polarized debate that people are either in the church or they're anti the church, mm -hmm. that that's actually not, not the nuanced picture and that there's a tremendous kind of gray zone and, and in between. So on the one hand, we've got kind of two kind of broad Christian segments. We call them Bible loving and Bible infrequent. So they are are people who are regular church attenders from our point of view um, bible loving very bible warm um, matters to their faith want to know more about it bible infrequent passionate committed christians but are struggling with the bible but then we've got some groups in the middle um, and they are you might say that they're spiritually curious you might say that they're spiritually open they they're not an open door right they're, they're not there saying I really hope someone to, comes and talks to me about the Bible but under the right conditions are open to that conversation they're interested in matters of, of faith and spirituality particularly at certain points in their life and what we're really passionate about is 
trying to get some of this insight out to churches because mm. these guys are in church communities right they're there at christmas yes. they're at weddings they're there at funerals yes. and when you have those moments with them that is probably the only time they're going to hear the bible that year yeah. if, if not less than that so how can you build on that because they're not the cold segments they're, they're not closed yes. Yes. um but they need to be uh, approached in a warm way and and they they make up well, our original research had them at one in five percent of the population. Our polling since then has put them at one in four. So we wow. we think, you know, that there's always wriggle room in polling, yeah, right? yeah. but there is evidence that there is spiritual growth in spiritual openness, kind yeah. of probably accelerated by the pandemic. And we we don't know how long we have this window of opportunity. Yeah. But we do know from our wider research base, Bible Society has invested in research for a long time, that things like death, job loss, yeah. birth of a child, made major yeah. life changes. These key life changes, yeah. Yes, spiritual questing points. Yeah. And these yeah. happened on an existential scale yeah. with COVID. Yeah. So it's, is it any wonder that we might see that reflected? Um, now, what's really fascinating about your comment there is it, it um, this is a slight aside, but I think when you're at the sort of occasional offices, these these kind of things where you know you've got a lot of non non regular non church people, yeah. the temptation for many in ministry is to avoid talking about the Bible. But actually, what you're suggesting is, in these moments where you have a Bible reading, the one thing you should be doing is expounding Scripture, explaining the Bible, talking about the yes. Bible. Yeah, absolutely. Because people are interested and in that. Certainly, uh, um, moments um, like like funerals yeah. especially when people some people in your congregation will be particularly looking for for comfort but you mm. you can't you can't assume that the way that they hear scripture is the same way that a passionate and committed christian right. kind of right. hears it and so we need to, clarity it needs explanation it, it needs clarity and it, it needs unpacking and yeah. it needs yeah. kind of um ways of, of kind of Helping, helping clear the rubble, you know, to, to help people get get to um, that personal encounter with, with the scripture themselves. Yeah. One thing that we often kind of suggest is maybe go with what's familiar at first, you know, nothing wrong with Psalm 23, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. remind people that the Bible can speak to them and it can be familiar. We yeah. did a Chelsea garden at the Chelsea Flower Show around Psalm 23 you did. a couple of years yes. ago. Really powerful. The the work on the ground was people like I had a copy of this psalm and I, I put it on my mother's coffin and really wow. moved remembering those moments that, yeah. that the Bible yeah. spoke to them. So yeah, ab absolutely. We the, these moments of and these marginal moments are, are really important yeah. for building that long-term yeah. trust. You know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing straight away. Now, the particular reason that I want to talk to you today, Rhiannon, is because of, obviously, there's stuff about scripture there. But the, but you mentioned that you also looked at church going behaviours. Now, we, we've got a narrative. I'm in the Church of England and we have lots and lots of numbers and those numbers are pointing in only one direction. And that is not only decline, but not quite accelerating decline, but sort of inexorable decline. And, uh, you know, the graphs are all looking one direction. Sorry, depending on the view, my <laughs> which direction might be a bit up or down. I haven't yeah. worked it out. Um, but actually your research that you repeated on church going behaviors actually painted a rather different picture didn't it yeah well we we poll a lot with um yougov we, we poll at least once a year and mm. the, the data that uh, we've been sharing recently is showing two data points so we, yep. we've shared those because it's the same survey so it's asking the same questions and that's very important from a methodological point of view isn't it yeah, absolutely. So we ask that question often because it's a really important way of segmenting our, our audience. It's what we call a golden question. Yeah. But sometimes, for example, we we polled recently on uh, attitudes to uh, the Bible and Christianity around the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. Right. So we asked that question, but we asked a whole bunch of other questions too. Right. And from a methodology point of view, that might affect how people answered that that one particular question, depending on the order. It, it probably doesn't for a behaviour question, but in terms of rigor, it's always best to be comparing things as, as closely as possible. So that those two surveys uh, that we've shared are identical. They're both on the YouGov panel. And um, the only difference is they were done a few years apart and they were done on, on different sample sizes. But um, 
that in, that affects margin of error, but it, it's okay. And what have, what have they actually showed us about what's happening around church attendance? Yeah, well, what we saw was that self-reported church attendance, which is what survey um, a survey question like yes. this is, is, is actually stable uh, between those two data points. So the first um, survey we asked in 2018 um, found that about 9% of the population say that they attend church at least monthly, and it was 7% who attend church at least weekly. When we polled that again in uh, 2022, it was very similar. So I think the 7% was the same. I think we were slightly higher on monthly, like 10% um, or, or something like that. But it, you know, it, from within margin of error, it's not significant. Um, and that's really interesting to us because we hear that constantly uh, about narrative decline. But when we look at other data sets, we see perhaps a more, a more nuanced picture. And what we're not we're not disagreeing with the Church of England. We we trust that that um, you, you believe us when we say we're in decline. We we believe you <laughs> <laughs> we believe the Methodists, we believe the Baptists. Yeah. yeah. Um and the, the Church of England is um very strong in collecting statistics. Yes. We, we've got a lot of respect for for that team. Yeah. Um but what we we also suspect is that that data set gets picked up by both the Christian press and the mainstream press. Yes. And then people extrapolate that to the church as a whole. Yeah. And actually broader data sets, ours and others suggest that there's a much more nuanced picture going on where there is growth in some places. That's even within the mainstream established church. Yes. Cathedral yes. attendance yes. was rising um, for a long time before, before the pandemic. Yeah. But particularly interesting are Church is probably primarily ethnically um, sort of diverse or right. um, churches recently established as part of immigration patterns yep. that are growing and don't count. <laughs> they they yes, don't count their numbers. So yep. um, what we're interested in here is that let's not internalize a constant narrative of decline and let's think broadly um, and consider other possibilities as well. It is fascinating the way that people pick up statistics on the Church of England, assuming that that's representative. I mean, somebody even said to me on social media, well, of course, you know, the Church of England is dominant in terms of church going. Peter Briley's research shows that of all the Christians in a church on any one Sunday, about 20 percent are in Church of England churches. So there's an awful lot else going on out there, as you've suggested. Now, in terms of methodology, in terms of your results, um, uh, and obviously I, I published my article, uh, my discussion with you on the blog, and uh, there's a few pushbacks there. Some people are saying, well, look, people are always going to over-report. So these are unrealistic. And also that, particularly through the pandemic, that people's over-reporting will have changed. But uh, I mean, you're actually a bit more confident in your results than that, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, like uh, all researchers, we are really open to other possibilities. And I think... Um, uh, yeah, there have been sociologists that, you know, some of the fun of doing research is having your theories blown out of the window. So we are really open to these these conversations. Yeah. In terms of this over-reporting, this is a really interesting one. It's often said that people overstate their church attendance. Yeah. There is some evidence in some context that that does happen. Um, the US has done some research on this, and I think it's particularly driven when you have um, a strong social desirability uh, to say that you attend church. So you have but to go- That's different in America than the UK, does, isn't it? And does that feel likely in, no. in, in Wales as a strong <laughs> social force? Um, you know, I, there, there probably are some people who feel a bit guilty that maybe they should go a bit more than they do. So maybe they only go a few times a year, they say they go monthly. Maybe they think they should go weekly, they go monthly, they say they go weekly. Okay. So there, there is going to be that rigor room. That to me is interesting in itself because that aspiration, I think, is really significant when you look at how much the role of Christianity and religion is changing in Britain to have people who are even aspirational about going, I, I think is quite important for what we were talking about earlier about this fringe poss possibility. So I, I don't think we should be too, too worried, um, particularly there. In terms of that overstating, though, it has to be within the context of of the pattern so what we would expect is sure let, let's say a proportion overestimate their their attendance um what interests us though is that we kind of think that that might be stable so yeah. Yeah. if you've got less people going to church 
let's be honest, because of a generational change. So, so yeah. people are yeah. kind of dying. And really, that should be the overstating people should be going down ultimately. Oh, of course, yes, well. yes, yes. So in so, fact, in fact, it's, it's likely to be the opposite. Yeah. So what you'd have mm. to argue here, and I can understand that some people would argue this, is that you've got less people going to church, but more people saying they go to church. To, to kind of keep those numbers yeah, yeah, um, sure. steady. That, that's how you'd account for it. Mm. That is possible. It's possible it's since unlikely. the pandemic, yeah. you know, the yeah. less people go but think they should. And that's why within sociology, we look at long trend. And we are in a very strange time after the pandemic. Yeah. So when we poll again and in five years' time, we'll probably do the big survey okay. again in a couple of years' time. Well, I'll time. come back and Maybe talk we'll to you in five years' time. Please, yes, please okay. do, definitely. I... <laughs> Uh, but it, it is, it's not that, that I think you would go that way, it's not that chart yeah. that, you know, you have in the Church of England. Um, and the, the pandemic is really in, interesting. We did poll throughout the pandemic as well, and we asked mm -hmm. about whether people were attending an online church. It was actually a bit higher than our kind of 9 or um, okay. 10 percent. 10%, um, that's interesting. And, and the other question, well, is when yeah. people say they attend, does that mean they watch online? Does that mean they attend in person? I'd have thought most people would say attending means actually going. Somewhere. Well, our, we think our question is structured in a way that probably leads people to going to a, a service. Because we become aware, we we still live stream our services. And we're aware that, we, we've, that we've generated this sort of fringe of folk who are sort of interested yeah. in exploring, who, who look online. Now, we, we talked a bit about the Church of England in decline. So um, if the church and the historic denominations generally are in decline, but if the total number of a church going, total level of church going is staying the same, it must mean that other, other churches are growing. Now, you've already mentioned ethnic churches, ethnic minority churches. I certainly look at my city here in Nottingham, and there are quite a few churches that are growing and, and getting quite large. Uh, that includes a new Church of England church plant, but it also includes an FIEC congregation, Federation of Independent Evangelical Churches. It includes Vineyard. It includes Black-led churches. So did your research give any clues as to which churches or which kind of churches are growing? Well, wasn't that really on the, on the agenda in terms of the survey? Between the two data points, um, the second survey is not big enough to go into that level with, with confidence. But if we look at the wider data sets, then yes, there, there is ample evidence of growth in those areas. Bible Society has recently invested in um, research into the Chinese diaspora. We're publishing it uh, in the next uh, few months. Um, the researcher who... You're doing that, I think, in partnership uh, with, Lon with um, London School of Theology? London School of Theology, yeah. The the researcher who um, led on that, um, he uh, is a statistician by training <laughs> and um, has done some really important work about establishing congregation size, um, both on existing um, congregations and then modelling what that could look like um, in, in terms of growth. And we are pretty confident in, in those numbers. And this is... Um, you know, relatively small in some ways at, at this point, but with things like immigration patterns, we, yeah. we do expect um, that to grow. And it is important to say that there is there are pockets of growth everywhere, in, including within the um, mainstream denominations like um, kind of Anglican church plants. Yes. And you have to kind yes. of get out and sort of see it. And what constitutes church, this question of what do people mean by a church service? Mm. I think of valid questions. I don't think it takes away from this, um, challenge to the decline narrative because I think we have to be open that church looks different nowadays than it perhaps did 50 yeah. years ago but that is the history of the church the church has always adapted and and changed mm. and, and it's it's a conversation for us as a church yeah. online church is still church right we you know we we are in a position where active Christianity is in a is a minority position um, so let's be really careful about where we draw those those boundaries. And in terms of a survey, I'm not particularly worried if someone is reading that question as, oh, well, I do I do go to, um, you know, Bible study through yes, my alpha yes. group or whatever. Yeah, I, and I count that as church, yeah, even absolutely. if they're not there on Sunday morning. I, I think yeah. we and the way that, that the way that Church of England has been counting its numbers has also reflected that recognizing that people. Yeah attending church you might be attending a worshiping community which isn't necessarily Absolutely. your main sunday service now in yeah. terms of in terms of the impact of this i mean i think two things come to mind uh which sort of follow on 
Uh, I mean, and one is just sort of an overall attitude saying, well, what difference does it make if we actually realize this rather than thinking, oh, it's all gloom and doom? I think the other question that's really comes up for me as a local church minister is, well, what can I learn from this? What, 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 what can we learn from the churches that are growing? Is there something for other churches which are in decline, particularly the historic denominations, to learn from the new churches? Yeah, um, and they're both really good questions. One reason we wanted to kind of share some of this data is when we're not here to say everything's fine, we're mm. in revival, mm. you know, whatever. But it'd be nice if we could, but yes, it'd be brilliant if we could. <laughs> and we are usually the voice of moderation um, within our team, but we are sort of saying, let's not internalize a negative picture that then becomes a self fulfilling prophecy that makes us no one wants to be on a sinking ship Let, let's not paralyze ourselves um by by taking on a view which isn't necessarily fully supported by a, a range a range of data points even if it is even if decline will will continue there is good reason to believe in some denominations that will continue to be the case we're, we're not challenging that yeah. The, the church church history sacred history is is full of that changing and you know small communities mm. growing but it, mm. it comes from the right perspective and the right the right attitude and we we just um kind of want to perhaps put a note of in, encouragement that we hope is also not a false hope mm. we're, we're not we're not in that business i do remember um, somebody either. once saying that the kingdom of god is something like a little seed that's very small and ends up growing quite big absolutely and, you, know, you could make a point that the church started with 12 people right so um yeah, yeah. you know uh num numbers numbers do matter and yeah. because it, numbers it of people matter. numbers of people and it, it does matter to how we feel about being yeah. part of a community but we also do have to be really kind of focused on on not getting too hung up on the yeah. fine points of, of this kind of thing because no one knows how many people go to, to church regularly really it is incredibly incredibly difficult um to measure so we're looking at best best guess is where we are yeah. and then it's kind of re what's our, our stance in terms of what we can learn from those that are growing there are no straightforward if we do x then then y will happen sure. that is not human nature yeah. Churches are local people in local communities. So the general kind of um, suggestion I have is to look around and see who's growing, yeah. um, see who's doing interesting work, connect mm. in. It, it doesn't mm. have to be um, like a competition between mm. numbers. You know, mm. let's join and learn from each other. The only kind, I'm not a missiologist, I should also say okay. very, very clearly I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are some specific things, again, the Church of England's research has noticed that churches that grow are ones where people are invitational i mean yes. and typical traditional anglicans are notoriously non-invitational they won't invite their friends and neighbors and family to church but actually anglican churches particularly new church plants they grow because people are invitational they'll say to their friends well come along this is great they'll, they'll have confidence they'll Absolutely. they'll invite people to discover more but i mean are you also notice some specific things around families and children yeah absolutely and um, the other thing to say is that churches that grow and tend to grow there's usually a growth plan behind them and, and that's come out in research before but our, our work on families is supported by wider literature that the best indicator of lived faith in adulthood is faith as a child as in you were raised by christian parents right. that's not just our research it comes up all the time right. yeah. and it is so so important to keep the people you have and one of the big effects around church going if we look over this last century has been that not that people lost faith and didn't go is that the children didn't return so when they they yeah. be, they weren't kept they 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 left yeah. and once people have not had an experience of faith and that is the generation emerging now mm. it is very difficult to start that that journey again mm. it it's not impossible it happens all the time there are numerous stories of this but in terms of let, halting decline keeping the people you've got is your first mm. your first step yeah. and investing in in children's work in in families work in young people's work to to help people navigate into adulthood is i think a very a very strong evidence base that that's a good idea mm. then Equally, though, the, the outreach works of these people on the fringe, 
their childhood familiarity through the school system, through yeah. um, brownies and scouts <laughs> and on all of those things, that that comfort of being in a church, that is a really important foundation for them when they are at these questing points, mm. that they they feel safe in a church yeah. so uh, absolutely um stopping decline starts with children and families yeah. and growth starts with um yeah. children and families and we know mm. that birth of a child and being the parent of a young child particularly as a mother is a is, is a key moment it's it's a questing point yeah. and that there are especially mothers of young children looking for ways to raise their children mm. who have a childhood familiarity with the bible especially mm. and would be open to having the conversation that's why things like messy church and yes. um, preschool groups that well, serve bubble church is on the latest thing in the church of england oh, absolutely they, they are they are so um important and it, yep. it's hard right to get people from there in in on a sunday yep. and that's where we need to be flexible about what is church and when does yep. the church gather to meet because the nature of sunday has shifted dramatically yep. and yep. women yep. are yep. lots of lots of alternatives practice. Yeah, yeah there are. And so thinking about is Sunday morning always the best time? Could it be Sunday afternoon? Um, yes. th those are, are, are important yeah, things yeah, uh, yeah. to consider as well. Rihanna, that's really fascinating. Just one last very quick question. I mean, does your survey point to anything particular in terms of the future shape and how the church might look different in 10 years time? Or is that just a, about look, gazing to our crystal ball? There's, yeah, it's a very brave person who makes predictions about religious uh, trends <laughs> in history. Um, our, our surveys don't don't go that far, but um, if we looked at wider data sets, we would probably conclude that if we continue to see generational shifts happening as they are, that some denominations will continue to decline because the older population continue to kind of pass and. Um, they haven't been basically replaced by by a younger generation so we we'll probably continue to see that yeah. i think the church as a whole will look more diverse in the yeah. coming decades the extent of that makeup they will be made up again influenced by whether the children of you know in immigrant churches like like our chinese yes. communities yes. whether they stay practicing christians and that that is not a given either and, and where we need to mm. um to watch it so more diverse but let's let's always be kind of optimistic about change um that can happen but from a research base and there there is a strong research um reason to be hopeful um and, and positive as well and there's, a, there's, a, there's mean... a theological reason to be hopeful and positive too we'll, we'll take that as well <laughs> but um <laughs> you, you, we're not we're not arguing that um there there aren't challenge there is real challenge but there is hope and there is opportunity uh, as well Rihanna, thank you so much. And I'm guessing that people can find uh, more information about this on the Bible Society website. Yeah, we have a website from our 2018 survey called Lumino. Um, right. That's part of the Bible Society website. So if you Google Lumino mm -hmm. Bible Society, you'll find us. That gives I'll you include the, the links below here as well. Yep. Thank you. That gives us the that gives you the eight segments and um, a description mm -hmm. of who they are, as well as some headline statistics. Um, it tells you a little bit more about the methodology, but it mm -hmm. also includes um, an, a tool where you can register, put your postcode in, and it will tell you how those segments look at your population, your local population level. So you can see right down to, to your church how those segments mm -hmm. fall out. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Rianne, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. With oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me.